Part three, overview of biometrics and general systems theory. Briefly, the content will be, first of all, the key concepts of biometrics theory. We are going to introduce the concept of the web of the biometrics, uh, different types of systems and subwebs, and different perspectives of the web, the field and uh, the web perspective. Then we are looking at the spatial organizing principles, in other words, how the different types of systems of the biometrics are organized in space. And then we look at temporal organizing principles, how the uh, systems of the biometrics develop over time. And then we look at seven forces of systems organization. In other words, what are the seven forces that make up a system, that co-develop a system? Let us discuss now the concepts of biometric systems theory. The first concept is that of the biometrics. Biometrics is the term we use to represent the web of life. The web of life is a very well known concept in ecology and it describes the interaction between the different systems of life. So it describes the different interactions of species like animals, plants, microorganisms with each other and with their physical environment like water, soil, light, territory, etc. These different species give rise to each other, contribute to each other, provide food for each other, provide shelter, form habitats, and in generally depend on each other for survival. Biometrics Representing the web of life is an abstract representation of that life in the sense that we are looking at how that web of life is organized, what its organizing principles are. We derive the term biometrics from the term bios, the Greek term bios, which means life, and matrix, which means pattern. In other words, Biometrics means pattern of life, or if we freely translate it, how life is organized, or what the organizing principles of life are. Some of the fundamental principles we suggest can be derived from the analogy of a fishing net. What we are saying is that the web of life is organized like a fishing net. Now, if you're looking at a fishing net, we can see that it consists of two types of structures, of strings and of knots. So a net is really a continuity of knots giving rise to strings, giving rise to knots. It's an endless connectivity of strings and knots. In the biometrics, we call the string-like systems activity systems they are representing process and we represent them as an error. So we can call an activity system also a process system and typical examples of activity systems would be functions in an organization, functions in my body like my nutrition function, my circulatory function or a business process in an organization, a line function in an organization, etc. Not like systems are called entity systems. And these entity systems consist of bundles of activity systems. They are interfacing like a knot in a particular structure. They are literally a field of interacting activity systems. Now, examples of Entity systems would be a planet, society, an organization, a person, a cell, an atom, a molecule, amongst others. So activity systems and entity systems interact and are connected within the web of life of the biometrics. 
the first principle we can see from the relationship of knots and threads is that a knot consists of threads. It is literally a field of interacting threads. Ultimately, life or everything in the biomatrix is activity or process. The activity system is the ultimate organizational unit of the biomatrix. Another principle is that a knot is patterned thread. So we can take threads and interact them into a pattern in different ways. And different patterns, different kinds of knots, give rise to different emergence or different qualities of the entity system, the knot. For example, we can take two strings and interface them uh, to make that pretty Japanese knot. Or we can take the same two strings and make a reef knot or a granny knot. Each of those knots has different emergence or different qualities or different properties. What is interesting is that the reef knot and the granny knot, as you can see, looks almost the same. There's only one small loop that is different between the knots. And yet that small difference makes a big difference in the way the knots function. If you're looking at the granny knot, if it's really tight, it's a strong knot and it cannot be undone. That is why we use it a lot in sewing. By comparison, the reef knot is also a strong knot, but we can easily undo it. That is why we use it in sailing to fasten the sails, and when we want to take down the sails, we can easily undo the knot, even if a great force was exerted on the knot. What does it mean in a social system, for example? Well, let us look at an organization. An organization has different activities, different business processes, different functions, and the way they interact with each other is what we call the organizational structure. So if we take two business processes or two functions and put them beside each other, parallel, and there's no interfacing, we have the famous silo organization. If we are interfacing the different functions and processes of an organization with each other in, for example, a matrix manner, we are getting a different kind of organization. So all the problems of the silo organization disappears once we interface the activities in a matrix manner. The same happens in our personal life. We have different functions like a family function, a work function, and if one of those functions changes, our quality of life, our pattern of life changes. So when we look at balance of life, we are really looking at how do we knot the different actions or activities of our life together. Another principle uh, we can deduce is that knots give rise to threads and threads give rise to knots. In other words, I as a person give rise to a particular activity system in my work for example, my specific work life. But at the same time, the work life, the thread, also influences how I as a person unfold and develop. So I give rise to my work life, but my work life also gives rise to me as a person. So we have principles within the biomatrix that can be deduced from how knots and threads are organized in a fishing net. We can distinguish three subwebs within the biomatrix. The first web is that of the natural sphere, that is nature systems, the web of life. Intertwined with that is the web of the psychosociosphere. Those are the psychological systems in the mind of entities and social interaction between entities, 
especially human entities. And there is the technosphere, that is the web of technological systems. Now, when we talk the natural sphere, we talk ecological systems, like, for example, soil, water, oceans, climate, etc. We talk physiological systems of the organism, biological systems, which we study in chemistry, cellular functioning, and physical systems at the atomic and subatomic level. Psychosociosphere, the psychological systems would include systems associated with emotions, cognition, self-reference, etc. Cultural systems, we refer to ethics, religion, aesthetic systems like the arts and culture, knowledge-related systems like science, media, communication systems. Then we have economic systems in the sociosphere. They, they are concerned with the production and exchange of goods and services. And we have political systems. How do systems interrelate with each other? How do they make decisions? How do they manage the systems, etc.? In the technosphere, we talk about technological entities, different classes of technological entities, and different types of technological processes. Now, these three spheres interrelate, they interact. They are present in every, almost every situation. For example, if we look at a situation like our e-learning situation right now, the natural sphere is involved in my body functions, my talking. Uh, it is involved in your body functions, like you're listening to what I say. The psychological systems would involve my thinking, my feelings right now, and yours as you listen to me. The cultural systems would be involved uh, in the sense of there's a particular appearance of the presentation. It has to do with science. There's an economic dimension, there was a cost involved in producing that program, etc. And the political systems have to do with the way you and I interrelate, which is indirectly at the moment. And then, of course, the technosphere interrelates. There are lots of technological gadgets that allow us to interact across space and time with each other. So these spheres at all times interrelate and at the same time we also need to distinguish between them. And the reason why we need to distinguish between them is that there are differences in their functioning. When we talk the natural sphere and the systems in the natural sphere, they have evolved relatively fixed functioning and we are describing that fixed functioning through the laws of nature. And any deviation from those functioning, fixed functioning, we would regard as disease or a problem and we try to bring it back into the norm of um, preferred outcomes that uh, these systems have evolved into. The systems in the technosphere are also fixed once they are designed because the car or whatever gadget I'm talking about is functioning according to the design. And if they malfunction, we have to solve the problem according to the original design. By comparison, the systems in the psychosociosphere have a lot more freedom in functioning than those systems of the natural sphere or existing technological systems. There's no law of nature prescribing how we should think about e-learning, for example, or how a marriage should function, or how we should design our education systems or our political systems. This is our choice and our design and according to our behavior as we choose it, those systems unfold. So there's a lot of free will involved. Likewise, there's a lot of free will involved in the technosphere in terms of designing new systems. We can conceive of any kind of system, technological system, we could invent. 
So there are difference in functioning. Why is that important? Because if I am intervening in systems in the natural sphere, I have to do so within the functioning of the natural sphere. In the case of the technosphere, I have to problem solve according to the design of the technology. Or if I do a new design in technology, I have to abide by the laws of nature as far as their functioning is concerned. In the psychosocial sphere, what we have to achieve is alignment. If we want to have systems that work, cultural, economic, political systems, we have to achieve agreement between us and other entity systems in order to make them work. So we need different kinds of methods to manage change, to design them or to analyze them. Up to now, we have looked at the biometrics from a web perspective, a web of different types of systems and different subwebs. Now, there's also an information field perspective. There's a universal information field that underlies all things or all systems in the universe. We depict that field as a big orange field. There is growing research from quantum physics, evolutionary biology, cosmology and consciousness that such a field seems to exist and that its function is to inform or put form into the systems as they unfold. So the spelling of information means coming from Latin informare, that we are putting form into things. So an um, information field contains the force that puts form into things. Now different researchers have different names for that field. For example, Böhm spoke about an implicate order as opposed to an explicate order that we observe. Sheldrake speaks of morphogenetic fields. Jung spoke about the collective unconscious that underlies all social systems. Laszlo speaks of the Akashic field. And then there is the cosmic consciousness field that uh, the mystics of different religions talk about, obviously with uh, different names. We call that field ethos field and it is defined as the field that contains those values, rules, guidelines that make a system unfold according to the way it does. And we normally use the analogy of the DNA to illustrate that the information that's packaged in the DNA is co-producing the unfolding of the organism for example. Now one of the characteristics of the information field is that it connects all systems from galaxies to subatomic particles, societies, organisms, etc. And one of its characteristics seems to be from the research in those domains I quoted is that the information transcends time and space, that it is coherent across time and space and coherent between different systems in different localities. So what that really means is anywhere in that information field, the same information is present at the same time and that from there it informs different entity systems. Put differently, the universal information field contains focalized subfields. According to Sheldrake, every species has its own information field which guides the development of these individuals in that particular species. And more than that, within a species, such as uh, dogs or a person, there are or humans, they are individual entities, individual dogs or individual persons who have their own variation of uh, the field of the species 
different a little bit from every other person or every other dog or every other plant of that particular species. So there are levers in those information fields. They get focalized around species and they get focalized around the individuals with that species, etc. Uh, Sheldrake also says that the behavior of individuals within a species can affect that information field and change the information field, the morphogenetic field as he calls it, and that that change in the morphogenetic field again informs the development of the species and that this is a mechanism for evolution. Activity and entity systems unfold according to this field. In other words, the web of activity and entity systems uh, unfolds according to their respective morphogenetic fields, uh, which are part of a more universal field. So what, if we go back to the entity systems, what holds the bundles of activity system together is a field, the ethos field. In summary, we can look at uh, two perspectives of the biometrics. We can look at it from a web perspective or from a field perspective. From a web perspective, we see the biometrics as a web of interacting activity and entity systems. We see the subwebs belonging to nature, psychosociosphere, and technosphere. And we look at the way those systems are organized. And from a field perspective, we focus on the underlying information fields and their subfields, which give rise to the web. Why is it relevant to have these two different perspectives? Because each perspective has its own methodology of analysis, design, problem solving, and intervening in the system. And at different times and in different contexts, it may be important to change the field, or in other situations, it may be more appropriate to intervene in the already manifested systems within the web as they have unfolded in reality. Let us summarize what the key concepts of biometric system theory are. First of all, there's the concept of the biometrics, which describes how the web of life is organized. Then we talked about two types of systems within the biometrics, namely the string-like activity systems and the knot-like entity systems which arise out of the interaction of activity systems. Then we discuss the three subwebs within the biometrics, the web of the natural sphere, which consists of nature systems, then the web of the psychosocial sphere, which is the psychological systems, the systems of the mind and the systems of social interaction, and the technosphere which consists of the artifacts and technological processes that we have created. Then we also said that these three spheres mutually interact with each other, but they are also different in terms of functioning, whereby the natural sphere has preferred outcomes described by the laws of nature, the technosphere is having fixed functioning according to the design of the technology, while the psychosociosphere has relatively more freedom in its functioning than the other two spheres, but still patterns of functioning have emerged. And then we talked about two perspectives from which we can view the biometrics. The one is the web perspective. We observe systems within the web of life and how they function, and that is described by a biometric theory. But behind the web, we also observe that there is an information field 
that gives rise to how the systems unfold, and this is the field perspective of the biometrics.